So we are live. Hello and welcome back folks to the Immigrant Programmers channel. Thank you for coming back. This is Pranav and this video has jam-packed information. This video has jam-packed knowledge. In this video, we are going to build a Mongo database for an e-commerce website from scratch. So if you are new to Mongo or if you want to start an e-commerce business and you are figuring out how your database should look like, well, this is the perfect video for you because we will discuss everything. We will discuss why you should use Mongo, especially for an e-commerce website. What are the advantages over others? Then we'll actually structure the whole backend, the whole database, I should say, and we should see what are the do's and what are the don'ts. We will see, especially when you're setting up an e-commerce database, e-commerce database for a website, you should see what are the pitfalls that people make and then regret later when they build a business. So we will we will see all those pitfalls. We will avoid all the mistakes. I will show you what things you should worry about. And I'll also show you how to build a proper structure, how to build collections, which are also known as tables if you're from SQL, and how to link them together and how to provide a meaningful environment for your users, for following and by following all the guidelines, because when you have an e-commerce business, there are multiple guidelines you have to take care of. For example, how and when can you store credit card information? What if your database got hacked? Will all the credit card details in your database be vulnerable? Well, we won't do that. We will avoid all those mistakes. So let's tune right in. First, I'll tell you why you should be using Mongo. And that is Mongo has a JSON like format, right? Right. If you are, if you have been using, if you have been using JavaScript or any other programming language, you probably have heard about JSON or JSON like formats. And it is very easy to handle both in the front end and in the back end. And in my personal opinion, I think there's no better database than MongoDB for an e-commerce website at least in 2021. If there's something in the future, if you are watching this video in the future, well, that's a different case. But I think till now, there's no better database than Mongo for an e-commerce website. So what we'll build today, we'll build a product collection. We'll see how to scale that product collection to have multiple SKUs because maybe you have a product, but then maybe you have different versions of it. Let's say you are a clothing company. Well, you have a t-shirt, but that t-shirt can be in five different colors and they're essentially the same product, right? So we'll see how to do that. Then we'll see how to store users, which can be very tricky. Then the payments, which is really the most uh, vulnerable part of your industry, of their platform. And we'll see how to properly store the payments info, the payment information like credit card, like maybe they, have, maybe they are using a Bitcoin wallet, Maybe they are using Stripe, maybe they are using PayPal. So we'll see how to handle all of that. And then in the end, we'll also see how to, uh, you know, make it all together, make it come all together, how to properly store orders, because that is the crux of your website, of your database. So let's get right into it. Enough talking, let's do some coding. So this is my Mongo database. This is, I just created a new database called Bookstore YouTube DB. I hope you can see it. I hope it's uh, large enough. Then I created an empty collection right now. As I said, we are going to build it from the scratch. This is an empty canvas right here. And now we'll add, a, add our first product because, well, if we don't have our product, we can't sell anything. So that's the most important thing. So I'll add a product. So I'll add a document. This is giving a Mongo default ID and I'm good with that. Let's say my company sells books. So my product name is Harry Potter. And the price, very important. The price, let's say is $29.99. Okay, not so expensive. Well, you also have to store the quantity because you need to tell the user if there's some left in stock or not. In the end, maybe you also want to store the author, right? That's that's pretty common. JK Rowling, I guess, was the author of Harry Potter. So now we'll insert this. Well, there you have it. You have your first product ready to ship, ready to order, ready to invoice, and ready to reach your user. But there's a problem here, right? If we go back to this document, I said that the product can have multiple SKUs, right? Now, how can we scale this 
into a product that has multiple SKUs. Do you think, uh, do you have a solution in mind? Well, if not, don't worry about it. I'll give you a couple more seconds and then I'll show you how to actually do that. Well, the easiest way in my opinion is that you can actually leverage this. So your product can be just a little different, right? I'll, I won't add, I won't write all those things again. I don't want to bore you, but I'll show you how you can improve this. So what you can essentially do it, you can add a new entry called as SKUs because essentially you can have multiple SKUs. When you buy a book, you can have a hardcover copy and you can have a paperback, right? That is, those two options are pretty common. So let's, let's add them to our website. So this queue is a Harry Potter hardcover. Let's say the price is somewhere around, let's say $29.99 is the price. Then quantity is 100. And then what's the feature of this product? Because this product must have some feature if, I, if it, this has a different price, right? Well, this is a hard, cover okay that's cool now let's add the next product which is the next queue i should say sorry for that and this is harry potter paperback and probably this is a little cheaper 1999 and the quantity is 200 because we think these will be ordered more and let's add paperback in the feature now this product has a skews array which has different prices but it's still the same product so that's very important you don't want to have a confusion in your database that you are selling harry potter 20 times then you're selling harry potter 15 times well no 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 you should see you are selling harry potter 35 times 20 of them were paperback and 15 of them were hardcover so that is the perfect kind of structure you can essentially have for your uh, users or sorry products collection so let's go to the next one right this was pretty simple. I'll delete the wrong one because we don't want this to stay in our database and pollute. So this is the perfect product that we have. Now let's add another collection. I would name it users because if we don't have users, well, who are we going to sell to? In the users, there are some fields that are pretty obvious. And just so you know, Mongo gives us a unique ID every time we add a new document but this time I'm going to have my own custom ID. And yes, we can have custom IDs and it makes sure that they are unique and everything. So in ID, I'll store the email. So I don't have to create another check that if this email is used or not, because Mongo will do that for me. Mongo will make sure that one email is not present twice in our system, in our database. And what else do we want to store? We want to store the first name, I'll just use mine for lack of imagination. Then last name. Cool. And then what we have here, let's say hashed password. Right. And let's say it's a random string. Then one of the most important things is address, right? An address probably has to be an object. And uh, well, in address, we'll have to store a lot of things. We, first of all, we we'll store country. So I'm going to enter my last address. So this is not my current address. So don't try to reach me here. This is my old address. So 2525 Sherbrooke East. Then we usually have two street, uh, basically lines for the user to enter in, right? So I'll enter the apartment here, apartment 40. What else? What else? What else? We have city. We have city. I'll say Moya province or maybe state if you're from India or United States or any other country that uses state in, instead of province. But because I live in Canada, I'll just use my example. Probably the zip code is very important. I forgot that. I almost forgot that. And yes, we have alpha numeric zip codes in Canada. I'll copy this because I'll probably use it again. Now we have a wonderful users user in our database. Congratulations, you just got your first user. What, what can be better than that? But 
there's something that we should improve right here, right? There's something that is missing. What is it? If we go back to this document, well, a user can change his or her address. That's fine. That's understandable. But what if they have a different shipping address? And right now, our collection, our document is not flexible. It does not allow a shipping address, right? What if a user, what if I want to order something for my parents who are living in another street? Well, you have to store that address somewhere, right? So let's, let's do that. Let's improve it. As I said in the beginning, we will avoid all the pitfalls that people make. We'll avoid all the mistakes that people make. And in the end, we'll build a good structure, a good database that you can actually use in a website. That is the target of this video. So let's uh, add another customer. I copied the old one so that I don't bore you. And then I'll copy this address. And simply, I'll just name this one shipping address. And yes, some websites do allow you to save multiple shipping addresses, like especially Amazon, there you can save tens of different shipping addresses. So probably you want to make this an array, but for now I'll just keep it at an object. Like I'll just uh, assume that a user has only one shipping address and obviously you can make it an array if you want and that shouldn't be difficult. And this address would be slightly different to 2520 apartment uh, 31, let's say, and the same zip code, the same province, the same city. Should be good. Now, if I insert it, this gives me an error. It says it's a duplicate key. And as I said, that even though this ID is not generated by Mongo, Mongo will make sure that this ID, is, this ID can never be repeated. So I'll just name it customer1 at gmail.com. That should do the trick. Now our customer is looking much better than before, right? We have the hash password, the first name, last name, ID, which is also the email ID. And then we have address. So basically the billing address. And we also have the shipping address. So it's, it's looking pretty good. I should actually just rename it to billing address. This looks better. Okay, so we have shipping address, billing address. This looks pretty good. So I'll delete the wrong user, the, the incomplete user, I should say instead. Okay, so we have users, we have products. What are we missing now? We are definitely missing payments, right? We want some payment in our, in our business. So let's create another collection. Let's call it payments. And this is one of the most tricky part. This is where you can get in a lot of trouble if you don't follow all the security protocols of your province, of your city, of your country. So I'm not a lawyer here. I'm just telling you how to use Mongo. So make sure you uh, read the laws in your own area, but I'll just create a basic one for you. So let's say I have a user ID because this payment profile would be linked to a user, to a user right? So I'll say customer at gmail.com right what else do we have for payments we usually have a type because we want to know what type it is it's a credit card that's good and then the card details the card type again there's so many types it can be mastercard visa and anything else so let's make sure we store that then the card number and this is where you have to be very careful. Let's say users, you can, you, let's say you store the whole card number and then you also store expiry month, which would probably be 12, expiry year, 2022, 2023, and then the CVV. Okay. It says the document has some errors. Okay. I put a full stop in, instead of a comma here. So I'll correct that. And there you go. You have your first payment profile. Congratulations again. But now you're in trouble. Why? You're in trouble because you actually store the complete card information. So your employees, if this is not encrypted, your employees can hack into the database and misuse this card. Even worse, what if someone hacks your database? 
Well, now they have information to millions of users and their credit card details, st storing everything from number to expiry month, expiry year, and CVV. And this is a huge problem. I don't think any country, any city, any province would allow that. So what are the things you can do to improve it? Well, number one, you can use encryption and decryption. That is the number one step that you should do, but that is a topic for another video. We won't get into that today, but even if you encrypt and decrypt, even if you encrypt data before storing obviously and decrypt after when you retrieve it, well, there's something you can do to improve this significantly. And I'll show you how, okay? I'll add a new document and this time, I will be better at storing. So we will still have these details, right? We should also have the status that is verified. That's very important. Then we have the card details, but this time we'll be much smarter. This time, yes, we will store the type. So the type is, let's say Visa again, but rather than storing the whole number, we'll just store last four numbers. Let's say one, two, one, two. Then expiry month, same as before. Expiry year, 2023. And what do you think? Do you think we should store CVV? No, never. You should never store the CVV. You should just store if the CVV is verified because the first time they do a payment, you can just store it's true, it's verified. So next time you may ask it, but you'll never store it in our database. And this provides a lot of abstraction and this provides a lot of security. Now just compare these two documents. In the first one, you store the full card number. That is very risky, but you also store the CVV, which you should never store. That's the security code of a card. You should never store that. So. Instead, you will delete the old document, you will save this one, and even this one would be encrypted in the real world scenario, but you get the idea. You get, you should just store the last four numbers, you can verify when the user enters his or her card details. You should only store if the CVV was verified as a Boolean true or false. So that would give you a lot of abstraction, a lot of security, and this is a better way to create a payments collection, a payments database. Now the next thing we need to discuss is what if your user is not using a credit card? What if your user uses a Stripe account or a, a crypto wallet? Now, this structure is not good for that, right? So we'll, I'll show you how to include those as well. So Mongo allows us to have flexible databases and that is great. So I'll just save a new document. So the user ID is still customer at Gmail. Type, this time is not a card. This time it's not credit. It's Stripe. Status can be awaiting verification. If you remember before, the status was verified for the credit card. And then you obviously get a token. Every time you use a third party service to save the payment information, you don't get the whole account information because that is what Stripe does. Stripe, PayPal, crypto, they all abstract the user's uh, information so that they are one step safer but they give you a OAuth token or some kind of token that you can refer to when you want to use this payment uh, type. So you can save this. Now you can check if the type is credit, you are expecting a card and the card details, but if the type is something else like Stripe or crypto wallet or maybe PayPal, well, you are expecting a token and you're also expecting the status to be verified. So right now we can see the status awaiting verification. So probably Stripe needs to contact you and give you a proper token. Right now, probably they just gave you a temporary token which should only be used once. Let's assume that. So we have covered a lot of things. We have covered why you should use Mongo. We have covered product, how to have products with multiple SKUs. We've covered users, how to change user's address, how to add a shipping address if it's different than the billing address. Then we stored payment details, improved payment details like guidelines for storing credit card. You should never store the whole uh, CVV. You should never store the whole card number. We also saw how we can use third-party payments like payments, tokenization, etc. The last thing, 
And the thing that brings all of this together is orders collection. Now let's see how we would handle that. First of all, let's create the orders collection. That's the most easy step. Let's go inside that collection. And what, what all information do we need? We need a lot of information to be stored, to be honest. But what do you think? I'll give you a couple of seconds to decide. The first thing we need is the user ID. That is very important. Then we'll need the payment ID because maybe every payment will have an ID associated with it or you can just use the Mongo one. So we will probably remove the payment ID. We'll just use the user ID, then the payment status. Processed, that's good. We received the money. Status of this order, it's probably shipped. Then we need to store amount, right? 70. Then the items. Now here you have two options. Either you can just store your product ID. So if you remember, we have already added products in the product table and we can use product IDs. So we don't need to write everything again, but is it a good option? And the answer is no. That's a very bad, a horrible option. Why? Because you don't really want to store product from product references because what if the product doesn't exist anymore? Like one year later, if the user wants to see his or her order details and you don't sell the product anymore, well, the link would be broken. And even worse, what if the price has changed? Now, because if you're using a dynamic link to the product's collection, well, maybe the Harry Potter book, which is $30 today, would be $10 the next year. Now, do you want to show the user that it's $10? No, because the order is static. And that's why I wrote in this document that the order should always be static. It should not be dynamic. You should not link this order with the actual product in real time. Because yes, user can go to your website, see the new price of the product, that's fine. But in the actual order, in the actual summary of the order, the thing should never change. So let's see what I mean by that. So let's say I have the SKU, Harry Potter hardcover, right? The quantity, that's very important. Quantity is one. Price, we, if I remember right, it's, it was $29.99. You can also have discounts. So you have two options again. You can either store the discount percent or you can store the actual discount amount. I'll just store the actual amount. I don't like to do many more calculations than I have to. Then the pre-tax amount. So in this case, pre-tax would be somewhere around 28, I guess. Yeah, should be good. Then after tax. So after tax would be somewhere around 30. Let's say we live in Canada, it's a highly taxed country. Then maybe user ordered multiple products. Harry Potter paperback, two products, it was 19.99. Let's say this has 0 0.99, so it would be $19, but the user ordered two, so 38. And after taxes, it's 40. Now, is it enough? Do we need to store anything else? We have the user information, we have the items, but it's not over yet. We also need to store the shipping address because that's very important. Even the shipping address can be changed in the user's profile, but the shipping address for this order will never change. It is static. So let's add the shipping address. I don't want to bore you guys, so I have already typed it in my notepad. I'll just copy the address. Perfect. Also the billing address, because again, billing address can change in the future, but you don't want that change to be reflected in this order because this order has gone to a specific address and will never change in the future. So there you go. You have the billing order, the ship, the billing address. Sorry, that was a typo. Maybe you also want to add a tracking ID if the, if you want to, 
if you want the user to be able to track his or her order which is very common now so let's say we have canada post and then some rumors so that's good now we have an, now we have a perfect order in my opinion this is really perfect let's see what we have stored over here we have stored items we have stored all the items and again this is static this is very important to understand you know it's static but still the static has to be very important because you can't store actual references to the orders to the users or a collection to the product collection to the payment collection because all those things can change in the future right what if a user has an address in montreal today and tomorrow he or she moved to toronto well now you don't want the shipping address or the billing address for this particular order for order id 2633 to be changed because this never changes this is history this is historical data okay if you understand that that's great the total amount status if it's shipped or not maybe in the future this will be delivered at some point yeah then we also save shipping address then the billing address then the tracking number so this all in all is a pretty good kind of structure for you to go and start your e-commerce website your e-commerce business because let's let's see what we stored we stored the user all the users in your website would be stored over here here you have the shipping address and the billing address and the hash password etc then you have the products the products can have multiple SKUs. so even even one product can have multiple versions like a, a jeans a shirt can have multiple colors right and so on in our case we have a book and our book has two SKUs. one is hardcover and one is paperback then the payment information and i told you payment information is very sensitive data you should never store all of this and you should always store just the last four numbers if necessary and you should never store the CVV. You should always say it's verified or not. Finally, the order. I cannot stress it enough that this has to be static. This should not have dynamic links to your other collections. This is historical data and should never change. The prices, the discount, the billing address, the shipping address, and the tracking ID, everything. This is static. This should st stay as it is. So we have prepared a pretty robust database we have prepared a pre pretty robust structure and we learned a lot today we learned everything creating a mongo structure a collection a document from scratch and taking it to all the way where you have a proper uh, database you have a proper structure to actually use in an e-commerce website in an e-commerce business so i'm really proud about it and i hope you learned something new today i hope this clears how to use mongo the advantages and disadvantages of using mongo and why and how you can create an e-commerce database using mongodb in less than i guess 30 minutes so we are doing really great so thank you thank you very much for your time thank you for staying until the end of this video i hope you learned something new we are coming up with a lot of exciting stuff in the future a lot of collaboration we also starting an angular course where you will have sunday live streams in which we'll build a website a great project from scratch till the very end every sunday we'll build it bit by bit and we'll build it together so if you want to hop on it i'll uh, i'll i or kritika will be posting more about it you will learn a lot about it and apart from that we are creating our own cryptocurrency we are creating an angular project we are creating a discord bot so a lot of exciting stuff is coming on very soon so stay tuned and I hope you have a great evening and until next time, bye-bye.